All right, so now that we know about atrial dysrhythmias, we're gonna talk about ventricular dysrhythmias. So we're gonna talk about what happens when there's a problem at the bottom of your heart. Because if you remember back to that scary, overwhelming PowerPoint about what an EKG is, um, that QRS complex, when we looked at that, um, we uh, kind of uh, discerned that what the QRS is, is, what it represents, what it's a picture of, is it's a picture of what the bottom of the heart is doing. Um, and so uh, if uh, it's really telling me, are my ventricles squeezing or contracting the way that they're supposed to? Um, and so I have problems at the bottom of my heart, um, uh, or I should say, when I have a problem with my QRS, that means I'm having a problem with the bottom of my heart. So remember that whole skinny fat debate, like how does my QRS or that pointy thing look? And when it becomes fat, like look in this rhythm down here, how it's really wide, that's a sign that there is a bottom of the heart or ventricular problem. And, you know, with ventricular problems, it's a much bigger deal than atrial problems. And I'm not going to say that sometimes there's not really, really scary top of the heart problems, but it's a lot more scary when the bottom of your heart's not doing what it's supposed to do. Because remember, what does the bottom of your heart, your ventricles, what's their main job? On the right side of the body, the ventricles push blood out to the lungs. Um, and then on the left side of the body, the ventricle pushes blood out to the rest of your heart. So that's kind of a big deal. And so if, um, you know, if they're not doing their job, that means, you know, sometimes little or zero cardiac output, zero oxygen to your tissue, zero perfusion. So this is why these are the more serious rhythms, more life-threatening ones. Um, and if, uh, you know, the QRS in, um, you know, ventricular rhythms is going to be wide and bizarre. Um, and usually if you're looking at the rhythm, you're going to be like, oh my God, what's going on there? Now I know what you're going to say is like, Miss Woodruff, like I already look at every single EKG strip and say, oh my God, what is that? But these look even crazier. These ones are like, ah, I don't even know where to start with that. I can't see anything there. So let's start with ventricular tachycardia. And so ventricular tachycardia is special and it's special in its own way because ventricular tachycardia can have a pulse or it can have no pulse. Um, and so the way I remember this one, it's fast and fat. So in other words, it's a fast rhythm. So it's rapid, like has a very high rate. Um, and then it's also fat where that QRS is fat um, compared to if you remember, um, when we talked about SVT or supraventricular tachycardia, which is a top of the heart problem, we talked about it being fast and skinny. So here's a big way to differentiate those. The QRS is fat and I have a fast rate or I have a rate that's going to be, uh, you know, greater than 100, which is normal, um, you know, um, uh, greater than 100, which greater than 100 is abnormal. Um, so the thing that's different about this one, like I mentioned, is that you can either have a pulse or no pulse, which means I could have um, ventricular tachycardia and be sitting there eating a peanut butter sandwich, which believe it or not, yes, again, once as always, I've had patients, I go in, their heart rate's 210 and they're like, my heart's fluttering a little bit. And I'm just looking at them like, what? And then, um, you know, a lot of times when people have VTAC, they have no pulse, which means, um, you know, they have the electrical activity on the screen, but there's nothing actually perfusing. It's just electrical activity. Um, and so when I'm taking care of a patient like this, you know, I'm not going to sit there and be like, well, let me, you know, check up blood pressure. Let me do all this. Like I need to do something immediately or very soon um, because um, otherwise um, this patient can be in a lot of trouble. So with this rhythm, because I can have a pulse or I can have no pulse. The first thing I need to determine is responsiveness. Is the patient awake with it? Do they have a pulse? So I'm going to start there. Um, and if the pulse is present, um, I'm not going to just be like that guy eating a peanut butter sandwich with his heart rate of 210. I'm not like, oh, you okay? Go ahead, finish your sandwich. No, we need to treat it. So, you know, then I'm going to start doing some of my assessments. I'm going to check blood pressure, you know, obviously check their oxygenation. But again, even if they're still okay, I'm still going to treat it. Um, and, uh, you know, we treat this rhythm usually through uh, medications like amiodarone, um, sometimes calcium channel blockers um, and or beta blockers. And then a lot of times we also use a procedure called cardioversion. Um, and we'll be talking about that in another PowerPoint about dysrhythmia treatments. Um, but effectively, um, you know, if a patient has a pulse, I'm still going to need to do that emergent treatment, give them drugs or cardiovert them to help to get that rate down to a normal rhythm so that I can get good cardiac output. If they have no pulse, if I go in, the patient's not eating a peanut butter sandwich and they are passed out, non-responsive, no pulse, I'm going to follow ACLS protocol, which means I'm going to start CPR. I'm going to defibrillate as soon as possible. Um, and I'm also going to give medications like epinephrine 
and amiodarone to help to get them back to a normal rhythm. So VTAC can come in many shapes and sizes, but as a whole, it's fast, it's wide, it's irregular. You don't really know what's going on. You're sitting there and saying, what in the world is that? This is what VTAC is. So if you thought it couldn't get any crazier, there's also ventricular fibrillation. It looks just like a squiggly line. There's no real discernible rhythm here, but there is electrical activity present. And that's what's so key. If I have electrical activity, but no pulse, then I can shock that rhythm. We'll talk about that on a different um, PowerPoint. But in ventricular fibrillation, keep in mind, there will never be a pulse. There's never, there's VTAC with a pulse, but there's never V-fib with a pulse. If the, remember we talked about atrial fibrillation where the, the top of the heart was quivering, you know, it's bad thing, blood pools, there's not good cardiac output. Well, imagine if your ventricles were doing that. Remember your ventricles are your powerhouse. So if the bottom of my heart is just randomly fibrillating or even just kind of like generally like just kind of quivering, that's not going to get blood out. I need a good squeeze to get blood out to the rest of my body or get blood into my lungs to get oxygenated. Um, so if um, my ventricles are fibrillating, um, I'm never going to have a pulse and I need emergent treatment. Um, I'm going to start with that ACLS protocol. Um, and this is, uh, you know, defib is a priority and this is a big thing. Um, they changed the protocols a few years ago um, where, you know, when it comes down to it that, um, you know, if a patient is in this rhythm, the first thing I want to do is defibrillate. Now, this doesn't mean if I'm sitting there and I go into the patient's room, they're in this rhythm um, and I don't have a crash cart. I'm not going to be like, hold on, let me go grab a crash cart. I'll be back. No, I'm going to start CPR on this patient and call for help. But if this patient is already attached to pads, they are ready to go, ready to get shocked. The first thing, I'm not going to start CPR. I'm going to shock them immediately. If they're already hooked up or ready to go, shock first, because the shock is going to be the best thing that can save this patient. Um, so again, you know, with this patient, CPR first, if um, they're not already attached to a defibrillator, defib first, if they're already attached to a defibrillator. And then again, we use medications like epinephrine and amiodarone, um, you know, to help treat this rhythm, just like in VTAC. And again, V-fib can also look a little different. It can be kind of fine or coarse, but as a whole, um, you know, it's a very uh, a regular squiggly line. You know, in VTAC, it's a lot more uniform. It looks like actual Vs, like, you know, like that wide QRS. In V-fib, it just kind of looks like a big old squiggly line that a toddler drew or something like that. So there's also a systole where you've lost your rhythm. This is no electrical activity. This is a flat line or it like, you know, it's, it's pretty much, there's nothing happening. There's no fibrillatory waves. There's no quivering. It's just a line. That's all that's there. Um, and the important thing that a lot of people get confused about this because on all television shows, they shock this rhythm. This rhythm is not shockable. You cannot shock when there's no electrical activity. Um, so for this patient, we're going to do ACLS protocol. Um, so we're going to just start the CPR and do epinephrine. We cannot shock them, but we can keep doing CPR and give medications um, and hope to get them back into that normal rhythm. Oh, and I should mention, going back real quick, that um, with this, like, it's a possibility that as we're doing CPR and epinephrine, that they could go back into, they could go into V-fib or V-tac. And if they do, then we can shock it. But as long as you have a flat line, we're not shocking nothing. If you get any electrical activity um, at, while we're doing CPR, great, we can shock that, but not when they have a flat line. So we never shock asystole. We can only shock when it's V-tac, um, you know, without a pulse, and I'm talking about defibrillation, or V-fib, we can shock that. There has to be electrical activity. So, um, you know, there's also what are known as PVCs or premature ventricular contractions, and these can lead to problems. So if you remember back to that enlightening talk about how the T wave is the resting period or the toilet, this is what um, the whole point of that, um, that long talk I gave about toilets, this is where it's all going to come together. So, um, you know, effectively what um, that like I mentioned about that T wave, just to refresh is that it's kind of like the time, like if I went to the bathroom and I flushed the toilet and then I want to flush the toilet again, like that toilet's not going to flush because the toilet has to fill up with water for me to flush it again. Um, and that's exactly what the same thing that happens in the heart. What happens sometimes is that that time that, um, you know, it's taken for my uh, toilet to fill up is a little bit longer. Like maybe there's something like not working where that 
periods a little bit longer. And maybe, you know, I get a little impatient. I'm like, I want to flush the toilet again. Um, and so this is pretty much what a premature ventricular contraction is. It's where, uh, you know, your um, heart tries to do a beat before, you know, you're really ready because you haven't fully filled up where you can contract again. So again, your heart gets excited and tries to beat during the resting period. Um, these can be normal, like, you know, like you're probably having some of these while watching all these cardiac PowerPoints and wondering what you're going to do with your life because it's so awesome. Um, but, you know, we start to worry if they're frequent. So, um, you know, and when you're reading test questions, the thing to look at is occasional is normal, like to have them occasionally, that's okay. Frequent, or if there's more than three in a row, that's a sign of a problem. Um, you know, we can point these out and you can kind of see in this picture here that these look different than all the other beats. Like, look at these, like all these other QRSs here, they look very different than this one. And so that's how this one stands out. So I look, these are upright. And then the PVC over here, it's the opposite direction. It's really wide and a little bit bizarre. Um, and the thing to keep in mind, the reason these are a problem, it's, um, it's one, is the fact that since it's during my rest period, you know, what happens when you flush the toilet too soon and it's not fully full? Like it's a little pissed off and it like kind of sputters a little bit and isn't working really well. And so, you know, that can be a, um, uh, what do you call it? A problem where a patient can actually go into like VTAC or VFib because their heart is irritated because it um, try to do that beat during the resting period. You know, the other thing is if you're having a lot of these, when you have a PVC, it's not an actual squeeze. It's kind of like a, you know, like a, you know, or like maybe like a little bit. So you're not getting perfusion. So if I have a whole lot of these instead of a regular heartbeat, so if I have a lot of, let me th think of it this way, like with the flush in the toilet example, if I, um, flush my toilet early, like sometimes a little bit of, um, you know, the stuff that's in the toilet flushes, but not all of it. And that's pretty much what this is too. Like, you know, if uh, it's like a pretty much, it's a premature, it's a not a full contraction. So at the end of the day, I'm just not going to get that same perfusion. So if I have a lot of these, that means that I have a lot of beats without perfusion, which means decreased blood pressure, low cardiac output, all those things we worried about. And PVCs can come in a lot of shapes and sizes. So they can come in pairs, like they're holding hands over here. They can come every other beat. This is called ventricular bigeminy. They can come every third beat, which is trigeminy. And they can be multifocal, which means they can go in all different directions or look different in the same um, EKG strip. I promise you do not have to um, get too, too in depth with this. It is important to realize that, you know, I'm going to worry a lot more like when we were talking about the fact that if a lot, if I have a lot of these beats, I'm not getting perfusion. Imagine if every other beat I wasn't getting perfusion, like that's going to be a really big problem. Um, so um, as a whole, um, we just need to keep an eye on patients with these and um, definitely notify the doctor. They can be a sign of like electrolyte imbalance or other like, you know, heart irritability or lack of oxygenation and things like that. So we just need to pay close attention to them. And again, occasional is okay. Getting a few while you're listening to this, that's okay. But if they're frequent or if they're um, happening, um, uh, like, you know, um, if they're frequent or if they're in like a lot back to back, that's where we're going to start worrying. All right. I hope you enjoyed ventricular rhythms as much as I did. See you next time.